Okay, good evening, everybody. This is a special meeting of the Public Works Committee of the Common Council on Tuesday, November 12th. Uh, at uh, we'll call the meeting to order at 6.01. Um, and we have present with us um, Ann, um, Barbara, Darlene, Heather, and anybody else in the room? And um, sitting in also from the council is is Johan and and uh, Nicole. And, um, first order of business is uh, public input. Input. Um, we'll open it up uh, for anybody that has uh, uh, any comments on any of the items that are on the agenda. Um, so, uh, Monique, is there anybody that's uh, on line that would like to speak? Linnell, you are unmuted. Thank you very much. My name is Linnell Jones. My address is 10 Point Road. Agenda item four, stormwater utility pre preliminary evaluation presentation is something I am happy to finally see. And I look forward to CDM's presentation. Thank you. Given the recent Save the Sound water quality ratings of Norwalk Harbor, education about stormwater and water quality is desperately needed. Again, thank you and thank CDM. That's it. Thank you very much, Lamel. Is there uh, anybody else? There is not. Okay, then we'll close the uh, public uh, input section. Um, go on to new business. <clears throat> First item on, the, on new business is approval of the minutes, um, which are attached to the agenda. Um, are there any comments or corrections that uh, are required? I'll note that for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any, any comments, any corrections? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Abstain. Okay. And we'll let the record also show that Nora and Just Geithner has just joined us at 6.04. Um, Nora, we just uh, are looking for approval of minutes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Drop in. That's fine. Are you are there any, any comments or any uh, corrections or minutes? Okay. So that's um it's one, two, three, four in favor and two abstentions. Okay. Item number two. Um uh, authorize the mayor Harry W. Willing to execute the second supplemental project authorization letter to the Norwalk Bridge Program, uh, 301-0515NP project, whereby the city of Norwalk will transfer funds in the amount of $821,637 on November 15th, 2024, and $821,637 on July 1st, 2025, to fund the undergrounding of utility wires in East Avenue from Fort Point Street to Olmstead Place to be formed by the Connecticut DOT account so noted. We'll have a second for that. Thank you, Nora. I'm Ms. Gondelsky, I didn't accept this. Um, I think this is a pretty straightforward item. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to say a word about that? Sure. So um, this is just uh, our commitment uh, that we need to pay Connecticut DOT related to the East Avenue Underground Utility Project. Um, uh, the state is responsible between Winfield and Four Point, and it is a city project just pretty much being done by DOT between Four Point and Olmstead. Um, about three, four years ago, you guys approved uh, this project, and we have already paid. Um, some of the funds that we have been paying installments. This is just to reflect extra costs associated to that project. And uh, now we got what we call the POW, and this is the balance that is needed. 
Anybody have any questions or comments? Seeing none, um, all those in favor? That appears to be unanimous. Okay. Moving on to item number three. Authorize the purchase of the agent to authorize a sole source purchase order for uh, Gabrielli truck sales uh, for the purchase of one 2026 Matt Granite plow truck for the sum not to exceed $310,139. Count so noted. Um, this is kind of a unique truck and it's also being added to a fleet of uh, trucks that we began uh, standardizing uh, back about 10 years ago. Uh, Nancy wants to say something else about that? Well, we're just really purchasing based on our uh, fleet plan that we get approved on every year in the capital. Um, so this was the truck that was assigned. The money comes in in July by the time we get a quote, and this is the quote. So just regular uh, of our uh, fleet replacement truck. Okay. Have a second on that? And a comment. Yeah. Not that anyone, I think, in this committee is unaware of this, but I just got a constituent question. So would you explain why we do sole source procurement on vehicles like this? Great question. Um, it's actually not a sole source. Well, it is depending on the, the vehicle that we are uh, purchasing. So some of them we use actually the state contract. Most of them we try to go with a state contract. Um, it is important to emphasize that we don't have different brand of trucks, neither different brand of vehicles, because the maintenance of it would be impossible. Mm -hmm. So we really try to keep uh, one brand of everything. So we have uh, the Mac, and then we have also uh, a freight liner that is pretty much our two of most trucks that we use. And it's the same kind of with the cars. There was a time that we were just using the Ford cars because those were the the parts that we ended up storing. But most of them, if not so source, we always use a state contract. We buy from a state contract. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. What's the life expectancy of these trucks? Well, we have been really pushing them. Like how uh, it depends a lot on the maintenance that we are giving. Uh, we have a lot of these trucks that are very old. Some of them are beyond 10 years old. And what we do is that we take parts from very old ones and then replace on the other ones. So probably there is some trucks still out there that some parts are from the first ones that we got. Um, we're trying now, and you guys are gonna see the next capital uh, request. Um, because we haven't had so many bad winters, we are buying more of the smaller plow trucks than the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. So there is, of course, some savings in cost because they are smaller and it can handle. We can use the truck either winter or summer uh, for different reasons. And sometimes when we have tiny roads or a small route, we ended up using it. Is this considered what's large or small? No, this is one of the smaller ones. This is a smaller one. <laughs> wow, but they are big. <laughs> yeah, so it's, big. it's a small one. It's not like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you don't mind, yeah, can I ask one more question? So if this is a small one, so what, what's the cost usually of a Well, it depends one? on how we put it on, but you can add at least some other hundred and then something thousand dollars. Yeah. It, it's interesting to, to go back and take a look at it in the package. You, you'll see that. It's like three or four pages of add-ons, you know, non-standard equipment, mm -hmm. I guess, that you could get. And, and we also started this program back in 2006, I think, yeah, exactly. standardizing mm -hmm. the, 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 the make and the models of, of the trucks. So it's a, it's, a good, it's a good approach to keeping costs down and get the most out of it, the most we possibly can out of these trucks. So it says, 2026, they already have the models out for mm -hmm. 2026? Well, we, we, the, the PO, we don't receive the okay. truck right away. Mm -hmm. we, we have to purchase and then they're going to secure our order. Um, actually, with this one, they said that if we get, if we issue the PO by the end of the week, there is a slight chance that we may get in three, four months. Sometimes it's a year until we get a truck. Mm -hmm. But this locks us into this part. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Any other questions, comments? And all in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, great. 
now this is the, the moment we've been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> as as Ms. Jones mentioned on the uh, on the uh, in public comment, this is really something that that's been worked on for probably more than a year. Um, and what you're going to get tonight is is just a presentation that gives you a pretty good concept of of what a stormwater utility um, looks like. Um, and the course to you is that we're not going to have specific numbers on how much it's going to cost somebody because there's a lot of different alternatives that we still have to decide on. But this is the first step toward um, evaluating uh, whether this is something that's going to work because they're really use. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vanessa and and uh, and CDM for the presentation. Okay, thank you. So um, I know that uh, as part of our MS4 uh, plan and master plan, there was also a conversation already for uh, probably a couple of years when we started talking about if the city should consider um, creating a stormwater utility. Um, and then uh, back on a couple of years ago, what, what we decided was that instead of us deciding we should do a little bit of an evaluation, so we ended up um, issuing the RFP, CGM Smith ended up being the, our consultant to help us with our MS4 plan um, that is being submitted to DIV, those that you guys approved uh, a couple of months ago. And also as one of their task orders was to also do a preliminary evaluation of our a stormwater utility uh, authority for novel. Um, so, we they've been working for probably almost a year and what you guys are seeing now and there was a lot of data and a lot of meetings between uh, staff and their team and we'll and we have today nick rossi and uh, mason to help us uh actually they are going to be the ones that will be doing the presentation for you so if you guys want to uh you're you probably can uh, share your screen. Uh, I think you have control for that and you guys can take from there. All right, let's see if I can not fumble the share. <laughs> can you all see it presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Change on my end. All right. So you still see everything? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Well, my name's uh, Dave Mason. I'm with CDM Smith, as you mentioned, and um, I've been working on stormwater utility programs for the last 20 years or so throughout the country and uh, was happy to join Nick today in, in presenting this evaluation as we work through with your community. So just a brief agenda here. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what stormwater is and stormwater issues. We're gonna talk about what a stormwater utility is and, and, and why folks are looking at these things. We'll talk about the budget allocation that your community has today for stormwater. And then we'll get into the rate evaluation, give you some idea of what, um, what a rate model and things might look like. And lastly, give you some examples of um, you know, how it impacts some other properties throughout the city, just so you have a frame of reference. So stormwater, coming back to the basics a little bit, um, you know, just when we talk to the public about these things, I don't think everybody always understands uh, the difference between you know, the storm sewer system and the san sanitary sewer system. So we like to start there and just, just set that frame of reference. So on, on the wastewater side, when you flush your toilet, use the sink, those sort of, you know, that sort of thing, there's a pipe connected from your house to the the sewer system in the street, but that, that, that flow from that system goes into a wastewater treatment plant. It's treated to a certain standard and discharged to, to the waterways that way. On the stormwater side, however, there is no treatment process that's happening. So that stormwater runs off your rooftop, your driveway, roadway, into the drain in the street, into a pipe that's separate from that sewer system, and then ultimately gets discharged to waterways. So we do have to take special care in how that water gets there and what the condition of that water, the volume and the, and the, and, and the quality of that water is because it does impact directly um, our environment. 
And from that perspective, um, we really deal with runoff and, and, and we think about impervious surface. So impervious surface is anything, you know, hard surface, your roadways, your rooftops, parking lots. And so on the natural environment, you have grass trees that soak up the rainwater, allow it to infiltrate into the ground. Um, so runoff doesn't happen very quickly or in, in a significant volume. But when we have rooftops and driveways and um, it does create more runoff, it runs off faster, it picks up pollutants. And so those are the types of things, the reasons why we have a stormwater system to help manage that. And also, you know, uh, the pictures up on the right, I'm sure everybody sees is it brings pollution along with it. So when runoff goes off the street, um, it picks up the sand and sediment and those types of things. And that's discharged, as I mentioned, directly to your local creeks and streams, and it's not treated. Um, so we need to to, to manage that. And we'll talk in a second about the regulatory requirements around that. Um, but we're ultimately, what you mostly hear about are flooding for, for sure. You, I'm sure you get calls every time there's a rainstorm. Um, and, and those things are, as we all know, are happening more frequently in larger volumes these days. Um, the systems that are, are, are out there to control this are aging, they're failing. And so there needs to be continued investment to, to uh, help help reduce the impact that those problems have on our, our citizens. And then as Vanessa mentioned, this is the regulatory side. And so I won't throw a bunch of acronyms at you, but the main one you probably heard or you may hear about is the M Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. And we always call that MS4. So we got three, at, three, three S's there. And so that mm -hmm. is a, the, the water quality requirements that come down from the federal government through the state and require your local program to implement very specific things to address water quality. And so they have nothing to do with the quantity side, but everything to do with what you do from water quality standpoint. And you all went through a process to develop a stormwater management plan that says how you're gonna comply with those regulations. And when those regulations um, come down to the local level, um, they're unfunded mandates. And so communities have to figure out a way to fund those requirements going forward over and above the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis to deal with flooding um, in your community. And so there are needs that Norwalk has from the stormwater side. And so specifically on the MS4 permit compliance side, got to screen outfalls, we got to look for illicit discharges, you got to map your assets. There's reporting requirements, there's public outreach requirements. Those are all things that have to be done from a regulatory standpoint um, that you may be doing in, in part today, but have to continue to be done under a regulatory framework. But moving on from that, you need to continue to maintain your system and improve that system as it ages so it, you don't have fa failures. And then lastly, as, a, as I referenced, um, the storms aren't going away. They're happening more more frequently and in, in, in more intensity. And so uh, stormwater problems just, just naturally are, are continuing to increase and, and cause needs for communities to, to address. So how are folks addressing these? Well, a very common way people are looking at, at these growing problems is to evaluate a stormwater utility. And so this is a new concept in Connecticut where the enabling legislation just happened a few years ago to allow folks to do this. It's not a new concept throughout the country. We'll talk about that in a minute, but it works just like a water and sewer utility program where uh, funds that are generated from proper, from customers are put into a dedicated fund that funds the stormwater system. They can't be used in other types of uh, other programs. Um, the contributions that are put into those funds are based on use and the use is, is typically associated with the impervious area that we talked about that is the closest proxy we have to what kind of burden a property has on the system. Um, many communities go down this path um, to in, 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 as the, the trigger is tends to be the MS4 uh, program. Um, again, it's a new unfunded requirement that folks are dealing with. And so a lot we see a lot of communities respond by exploring this, this avenue. But one of the things people like about it too, and we'll talk about this as well, is that it can encourage best management practice on property. So if they're doing things to improve the quality of water that leaves their property or reduce the, the amount of runoff that leaves their property, you can give them a break on their fee. And so people like that uh, carrot approach as opposed to a stick approach. Mm -hmm. Kind of mentioned this here, the, the most common way that utilities are set up 
is re related to impervious area. About 80% of the utilities in the country are based on some measurement of impervious area on property. Since again, that's the most direct correlation to the amount of runoff that property generates. And that's really what we evaluated here. A lot of when people talk about stormwater utilities, a lot of people like to make the comparison between, you know, what are the pros and cons between a tax-based system and a, and a utility system? Certainly, if you need to generate uh, revenue to fund your stormwater program, you could you could obviously raise taxes to do that. But as we all know, taxes are based on the the assessed value of a property in most circumstances, which has no correlation to uh, the amount of runoff that that property generates, and thus the service that property requires in order to manage that runoff. And so this is an example from another community. This is not Norwalk, but you can see how the pieces of the pie change from the left to the right when we base the 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 property class, the customer class on the amount, the, the value of their property versus actually the amount of impervious area in those properties. And so um, on the left-hand side, you can see things like undeveloped property that doesn't have any impervious area is obviously still paying taxes on that property. Um, tax exempt properties, uh, which may have a lot of impervious area, don't pay anything under a tax-based system. Whereas on the right, you only have, you're only charging based on the amount of impervious area. So you can see when you add in the tax exempt pieces and you remove the undeveloped pieces, it can change the where the program's funded from. And it's more equitable in terms of it's based on the impervious areas. As you can see that some some user classes are maybe subsidizing others in the in the tax based systems mm -hmm. where they wouldn't be in a in a fee based system. And then I mentioned encouraging stormwater best practices. So if you have, if you have a system based on impervious area, it discourages people from building extra impervious area they don't need. So maybe reducing the size of that parking lot or using a um, you know a pervious pavement. And then also as they implement practices like rain barrels and rain gardens, and they can get a a, a reduction in their fee. And I mentioned these are not these are not new. There's, a, there's over 2,000 stormwater utility programs throughout the country. They range all kinds of sizes. I actually had the pleasure to work on the smallest one this year. Uh, which is a little community in Florida, 84 people live there. They have a stormwater utility program, but so does Los Angeles County. It's 10 million people. Um, in Connecticut, being as new as it is, there's only two in Connecticut today, although there's several in the Northeast. Um, but being New Britain and New London are the are the only two in Connecticut right now. So why is the stormwater utility maybe something you'd want to consider? Well, again, it's dedicated revenue to address a problem that you know you're going to have over an extended period of time. Um, the, this problem can have a direct impact on your on your local economy. Um, you know, you, being a, being on the water there, if you have uh, issues with pollution, it can impact your economic opportunities. Um, but there are regulatory commitments, so the things you just have to do, regardless of what your customers are asking you to do. And so that's another reason to think about it. And then lastly, again, as I mentioned, these problems are not going away. They're only getting worse as the climate changes. But we are certainly uh, Norwalk doing things today to address stormwater, and that's one of the big, big things we do with these projects is to really get an assessment of what are the, what are the uh, resources being devoted to stormwater treatment and stormwater management today. And so we spend a lot of time with your staff uh, going through their day-to-day -day activities and looking through budget documents and talking to your team about what they're doing today. And so. There's nine staff in, in the in the office of engineering and office environment that are working on the stormwater program. They're not fully doing this every day. They're pieces and parts of their program um, or, or part, parts of their activities. So they're not dedicated to stormwater, but they do touch it and, and, and benefit it. Um, but on the field side, you do have several staff that are out there that are 100% working on stormwater projects every day, construction, a maintenance, that sort of thing. So on an annual basis, we estimate that you're spending about $4 million a year on operating the stormwater system. So this is kind of the day-to-day -day operations of your program, cleaning catch basins, ditches, uh, uh, pipes, repairing pipes, that sort of thing. And on the capital side, so over and above that operating cost, you do have a capital program that includes a lot of stormwater projects. And so uh, looks like about three to five million dollars a year are spent on capital stormwater projects, an additional million dollars a year for on-call contracts to deal with stormwater emergencies as things break and you have to go out and repair them. 
Um, and then there's some small projects out there, but on an annual basis, it looks like about four to $6 million a year over the last five years is what you've been spending on, on stormwater projects. So that's over and above the operating costs that we just talked about. So there are a lot of resources being put, put out there today for stormwater. But what we look at here is, you know, what would what would what would it look like if you were to fund a program from a stormwater utility fee versus how you do it today out of the general fund? And that's kind of the last step that we do in these types of projects. Once we understand the services and understand what um, the revenue need might be, how might we fund this? And so I mentioned before, it's all based on impervious area and the amount of impervious area on your property. And, and one of the great things and resources you have in Connecticut is the University of Connecticut has an impervious area database. It's a little bit old, uh, 2012, um, but it gives us a great um, piece of GIS information that we can use to, to develop a rate model and at least get an estimate on if you'd have charge a certain amount of money per property per month, what would that look like in terms of revenue? And so the basis of nearly, you know, most of the stormwater utilities in the countries is based on, you know, starting point is the impervious area on the residential lot. So what is a, you know, the residential homes are kind of the same. So we can look at that being the basis of how to charge folks. And so if the average residential home is a certain size, we're going to charge everyone else in comparison to that single family home. So if you're looking at this example on the right and you say, all right, one of these commercial properties is 10 times as big as the residential home. Well, they would have 10 times the fee because they have 10 times the impervious area, 10 times the runoff. Um, that's been the most legally defensible and, and um, uh, program throughout the country that's been tested over time. So we don't apply some model from other some other community. We really look at it on an individual community basis. Every community is different in terms of their development trends. And, and so we did that here. And so we took that data from University of Connecticut and we evaluated what does a single family home look like in Norwalk. And so this blue line here, <clears throat> excuse me, blue line here represents that distribution of properties and the, the size of the properties and the amount of impervious air on those properties in Norwalk. And so the median of that distribution or really the middle point of that distribution is 3355 square feet of impervious area. So that's the rooftop, the driveway, maybe the pathway from the driveway to the house. We can look at that and say, that's what the typical single family home from our impervious area standpoint looks like in Norwalk. And then we can talk a little bit here in a minute about how we can be more fair on that and say, well, there's some bigger houses and some little houses and what might we deal with that? But the 3355 is what we would call our single family units, our base, our base amount of impervious area that we're gonna charge everyone else based on. And so here's a summary. Here's a summary of the uh, of all the impervious area in, in Norwalk based on that data um, from the University of Connecticut. And so the thing you'll kind of note here, and this kind of gets into what we talked about earlier about the distribution of impervious area. In that uh, third column that says percent of total parcels, you can see that 90% of all the parcels in Norwalk, 89% are residential properties, right? And then on the bottom, you'll see 11% of the properties are commercial properties. If you go all the way over to the right, you can see where's, where's the impervious area. So it's not just the number of properties, but where is the impervious area? And you can see the change there that about half of the impervious area is associated with residential properties and half is associated with commercial properties. So you can start to see how uh, looking at it from an impervious area standpoint changes where um, where the, the contribution to the problem is coming from and thus uh, makes it more equitable in terms of how we may fund the program from a stormwater perspective. So this is all your data and this kind of presents the basically the revenue base that we can look at building a rate model from. And then I mentioned briefly, um, there's various ways with the, to look at these rate structures to make things more equitable. So we can charge, as I mentioned earlier, one flat fee for all the residential properties because they're all kind of the same. But a lot, of, a lot of communities these days look at a tiered rate and we can say, all right, well, yeah, most of them are kind of the same, but the ones on the far end, the top 10%, are statistically a lot larger than the average and vice versa. 
the bottom 10% are statistically a lot smaller than the average. So that might be your fixed income properties or in disadvantaged communities, that sort of thing. And so we can charge a little bit more on those and a little bit more on the large ones because they represent, you know, statistical deviations from what the middle, you know, kind of average home looks like. So a lot of communities do that nowadays to, to be more equitable than just providing a flat fee. And we have that data now for you all. And here's a rate table. So this just gives you some things to, to, to chew on here. Um, over on the left would be the base monthly rate that if you charge the base monthly rate per property, um, per residential property, um, and that range there on the left, the second column would estimate what's the annual revenue you would generate from that. So in this example, if the fee was $10 per month, Per residential property, and then of course, and you know, there's a proportion for the larger properties. You would generate a little bit shy at five million dollars a year from that. And then, just for a point of reference, you know, that revenue is coming from all the properties in the city. No one's exempt because it's based on the impervious area. So there's some money mm -hmm. that comes from city-owned properties. There's some money that comes from the tax-exempt properties, but that's all rolled into that. And for that one example that kind of $5 million, but you can just kind of see where the revenue is coming from all the properties and, and no one's exempt from the fee. And here's just, you know, they're not many in Connecticut, so we didn't think it was, you know, you couldn't just look just the Connecticut property or Connecticut communities. This is just all, uh, uh, all the properties, or not all the properties, all the cities in the Northeast that have a stormwater utility. So you can see a, a wide range of, of fees. Um, I wouldn't say there's a direct correlation to the size of the community. Um, it really comes down to what services you're providing. I think it was alluded to before, you don't have to fund the whole program with the fee. So there's lots of options and way people, some people just fund the MS4 program, some just fund capital, most fund their entire program, but but it just gives you a point of reference on what types of communities are out there and what, what they might be charging their customers. On average nationwide, uh, the average is about six dollars per per single family unit or per equivalent residential unit, and that's been gradually going up over time. Um, and then, for point of reference, in Connecticut, New Britain charges six dollars, right about the average. New London charges theirs a little bit differently. They do a rate per thousand square feet of impervious area. So if you normalize that to our 3355 that we talked about, they're charging about eight dollars, a little over eight and a half dollars for a single family home. So that just gives you a reference for the Connecticut communities. And lastly, we'll wrap up with the non-residential side. We don't want folks to think just about the five, ten dollars per residential customer. As I mentioned, the non-residential are going to pay in proportion to that in a, in a utility type program. So this just gives you a point of reference for different types of properties that exist in your community. So a Home Depot, so your kind of large box store, you know, your Walmarts, Targets, those kind of things. Um, over, on, over on the right, you can see the red line measures the pervious area. So the driveway, the parking lot, the rooftop. And so that property has just shy of 350,000 square feet of impervious area. So you take that number, you divide it by our base, which is the 3355. So they have about a hundred, a little over a hundred billing units on their property. So again, that residential home, if that residential home, let's use the average $6 that we talked about for the nationwide average, the residential home pays $6. This property pays 600 because it's about a hundred times as big. So that would be their monthly charge. Um, so that's how that works. And then we'll just show you a few other examples just for a point of reference. So here's a Chick-fil-A. Um, their impervious area, just shy of 60,000 square feet of impervious area. So their billing units is 17. So again, think about that math, 17 times your $6 a month if you're using the national average as a data point. So you're about $100 a month at a Chick-fil-A is what their utility fee could be. City Hall pays as well. So 74 billing units gives you a perspective on the size. Um, the elementary school, again, no properties are exempt. Um, so this is all the impervious area in the city. Their billing units, 58 billing units. The hospital is probably the largest property in town. So 150 billing units there. 
And then here's kind of the small business type restaurant property, 14 billing units. So that just gives you a bit of a scale of what that looks like in comparison to the single family home. So you have a frame of reference. So just kind of conclusions, um, really what these programs, a lot of times, you know, the discussion comes down to the pros and cons. It's just a different way of funding a program. It's not required, but it's um, being encouraged by the state um, by offering grants to help folks evaluate these things. Um, the pros being it's it's equitable. And that's really the main um, positive about a program like this. Is it's based on the amount of impervious air you have on your property which is the amount of runoff you generate, which is the amount of service you require from your property. Um, the fees are fully dedicated. They can't be used on other types of projects and programs. They gotta be set up to fund your stormwater program and only pay for your stormwater program. And then they incentivize best practices, whereas other types of funding mechanisms don't necessarily do that. Um, the cons would be, you gotta make sure the customers understand the need. It's a, a different way of funding it. It's a it's a it's a new fee, um, so they gotta understand what the need for it is and and why why you're doing it. So there's a public education and outreach component to it. Um, all properties pay, so some people aren't used to paying for this type of service. They would be paying for it under this program. And then lastly. There's an administrative component, of course. Um, there's a billing process that gets, has to get set up. Does it piggyback on another billing process? So there's an administration component. So there's, you know, certainly some cons to it as well. But there's a lot to to chew on when people are considering these type of programs. Those can tend to be the the biggest considerations. So with that, I'll wrap up and turn it back over to to Vanessa to talk about next steps. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. That was great. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to open for questions soon. Um, so, um, again, this is, I know that he was able to concise everything that, uh, and all the staff is here that behind you guys that contributed for those slideshow with all the information and all the data that they needed. Um, so, what would be next? Would be how we bring it to the next step if that's what uh, the city decided that we want to move forward. So, we need to engage a consultant, right? To continue um, developing what will become the stormwater utility. So first will be to analyze the level of service that we're gonna need. So, and that will be in more detail about really how would be the fee set up. Um, are we going just for the impervious area? Are we gonna do the break based on the residential size? Are we gonna give uh, some deduction if you do some incentives related to runoffs? So all that is where that can be more detailed. Um, there will be, as Dave mentioned, a lot of stakeholder and public outreach because this is not something to be successful based on what we have been hearing when we go to all mm -hmm. these conference everywhere, that there was a lot of public involvement mm -hmm. and they have to be part of it since they want. So, um, so that's what also will be part of the consultant uh, trying to uh, teach the people and explain what will be the need for. And then, of course, update and finalize what will be our SFU. Uh, as of now, we have based on that median uh, impervious area that is 3,355 square feet, but is that really the correct number, right? Um, another thing that will have to be done is we have to go back and review ordinances uh, because now this will have to become a utility um, like um, enterprise, the same as we have the WPCA or the parking authority. So what will need to be done um, on under the ordinances? And the last item I think that is one of the hardest is how we're going to build people. Um, as of now, uh, for instance, we have our sewer bill under our tax, although it's separate, but mm -hmm. we send it out uh, together. Um, I, we believe that maybe we need to break this separately, the same way that we're talking about eventually uh, garbage, solid waste, and maybe even sewer combined with what will be utility fees, right? Mm -hmm. And then there is a lot to be developed in also, we may need a separate software and all that. So that would be like what would be the next steps until we would be ready to come back and really get the approvals to move forward. 
Um, so I believe that uh, with that, we finished the presentation. I believe that uh, uh, we have the questions and answers. So please feel free to ask whatever you guys want. Um, Dave is here. I guess I got my hand up first. Um, it's more of a statement than a question. Um, you know, we've been looking at this uh, for that's you and me like for four or five years. They want to come here just in case. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah so it's the yeah, we've been looking at it for much more than just a year. It's four or four or five years into this, and we all went up to New London maybe two years ago to take a look at that. And I think that this is a really exciting and really necessary mm -hmm. revenue source, mm -hmm. as we all know. And Jim and I were there on August 18th watching stormwater race through our city, <laughs> people getting flooded in our neighborhoods. And there's real needs for these types of stormwater projects. Mm -hmm. And it is getting harder and harder to fund through just tax dollars. And it's not fair that the only people paying are the residents. It's really important that the other mm -hmm. impervious mm -hmm. surface owners yeah. contribute to so, this. Mm -hmm. And some of them don't pay any taxes to mm -hmm. the city and they're getting a complete free ride. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, certainly public engagement is gonna be really important so that people have a better understanding that this is a really, good way to raise more money in a fair way for um, the problem that's caused by the pavement itself. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking this on. I'm yes. really excited and however I can help and support, please let me know. Yeah, well good. That's it. It's <laughs> <laughs> not more, go ahead. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree very much, Michelle. And I'm really this presentation was very helpful. I really appreciate um, Vanessa and your staff really pulling this together. I think being able to see this in our specific context mm -hmm. is very helpful. And I do agree that I think the equitability um, and the way that it incentivizes people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, just looking at some of those maps, and you think, huh, right. would people really build this way if they had to pay for every one of those right. square feet? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really aligns with kind of some of our overall objectives and goals. I do think that the um, parts and pieces of the incentivizing, doing it better is going to be really important to figure out. Um, as a homeowner who... Um, grappled a little bit with this under some of the new um, requirements that DPW has been putting on homeowners for when they make changes to grapple with it on their own property. There are not enough um, engineers to hire, even if you want right. to as a homeowner, right. much less mm -hmm. are you going to pay, you know, thousands of dollars on top of the other, your other construction cost nightmares. And so really, I think it's, you know, be really important to start thinking about what are off the shelf solutions that we can offer people? How can we sort of um, figure out ways that are credible and actually do work that also don't require individualized, expensive, you know, things that were just literally, there aren't enough bodies to do. Um, and so I think thinking about that even from the get-go is gonna be important to having people have buy-in, right? So that people mm -hmm. feel like the city is really approaching this problem as a sort of joint. We all need less flooding. We all really need less flooding. And so like, how are we all working together to make that happen? Um, I am also, I have to say the math um, is interesting as well. I'm surprised by how little people are charging yeah. because it doesn't seem to me like it's generating as much revenue. I mean, if I'm reading this correctly, we're are, we're currently spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 million a year. Mm -hmm. And in order to get that level of revenue, we would be charging fees that look like they're significantly higher than the national average. Um, and so, you know, I'm curious as to how that sort of thinking plays out. Is it that other, that people are, not doing as much investment in improving their systems. And so they others, others, you know, municipalities aren't currently having as much capital costs as it on it, or is it that folks are only using this to fund part of their expenses and they're putting the rest of it on their capital budget? Mm -hmm. Because there is some fairness, right? We talk about capital being equitable in a sense that it asks people over the lifespan of the project to pay for it. And so maybe there is a logic to having your day-to-day -day operating be funded by people immediately and your mm -hmm. long-term being shared. That said, every time we put it on capital, we're also eating enormous amounts of interest on it. And so anyway, I'm I'm excited to see this. I think there's a lot that we can really think through about kind of what the best model is or the best you know approach. But I feel like this is, was really compelling as a way to address, particularly for a city where, again, I actually think people will very much understand because we mm -hmm. have been dealing with yeah. so yeah. much flooding yeah. um, that I think people see the, we'll be able to see the value.
So Vanessa, I remember that when we were at New London, they only fund part of their stormwater with these funds. I think that they do have some in capital and mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. in the stormwater, but that's just my memory. Mm -hmm. Is that what you remember and, as well? And there was there is one big difference. Um, New London, when we went, what they told us is that before they didn't do anything related to the MS4. So they were not in compliance with anything. Mm -hmm. um, those numbers that you guys were seeing, it is really based on things that we do. So even when, right. if you read the plan, you're going to see that a lot of things that we were proposing in the plan, we already do. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, sweeping the roads is part of the MS4. So they didn't do that in New London. They didn't have the money to either sweep or buy the machine. So they anything for them would be a lot. Mm -hmm. So what is showing in our case is that we already fund a lot related to the program. Um, so the question is, how are we going to continue with funding? Should we continue funding the same way that we are? Should we break or should we try to transfer everything to the authority? And that transition, and, and Dave can, of course, Dave is the expert. Dave, how have you seen uh, the other uh, communities uh, starting? Yeah, I, I mean, I would certainly say you all, if for, for folks that don't have a utility in place yet, you all are doing a great job specifically on the capital side, because that, that's what I see missing in most communities is they're not funding any capital if they don't have a utility because they don't have a way to accrue that money to do that. And it's just hard to compete with the fire station and the schools and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I think that's why you see some of that. But you're right. there There's a lot of these newer utilities aren't funding their entire program right away because they haven't done a master plan or they don't know what their needs are when they when they set up the fee so they're just sort of getting it off the ground and then they're building it over time um so a lot of cases when we go what we're seeing a lot of nowadays especially in the southeast where people are going back and revisiting their fee because these fees a lot of times will stay they can stay stagnant for a period of time um when they go back and reassess it, you know, five, 10 years later, like, oh, goodness, like we're not generating nearly enough now. Now that we know what our real problems are, um, mm -hmm. they're having to raise their fee to, to catch up. So there's a lot of different ways, you know, the getting over the just the setup, uh, you know, getting it off the ground and getting the public buy in. Um, a lot of times people don't fund their entire program day one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think Vinnis and I talked about this a little bit, a lot, actually, the other day, and that, you know, first of all, the $10 million is maybe a little bit higher because uh, six of that is capital, and you're not going to pay that capital every year. So that, that's going to be paid off over 25 years or something like that. I mean, it's going to be funded. You're going to have debt service in there as well, but it still doesn't bring it down that much. It cuts it just about half. But um, you, you know, it's it's hard to rely on on coming up and saying, oh, it's going to be ten dollars or it's going to be more than eighteen dollars or whatever that number is. I think there's still a lot of work to be done before we can start to really pinpoint and, and make make decisions on on what it's going to cost, right? Yeah. But you know, having said that, you still have the ability to segregate some of these things. And the other thing that we've got to remember is that this is all built into our tax base right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's it's really not an additional tax that we're talking about. It's it's actually giving us the, the ability to focus in on that particular more than any other thing in our capital budget. Or you, I, you can't break down a capital budget in the public schools, whatever. But we I mean, really focus in on exactly what our capital needs are for this particular area and say how much do we want to do and how much do we, do we need to do and how much is it really going to cost us? And also by spreading it out over some of the uh, tax exempt and city yeah. pieces, uh, it's it's so much more equitable. The only question I had, uh, Mason, was that I noticed that the difference on the um, uh, commercial was only about 4%, I think it was between 28 and 24%, um, which... Yeah. yeah, and that's not well. Just to be clear, done. that's not your community. That that takes a little more effort to get to this. This is from another community that we've worked with, and just how their their percentages got broken out. You know how, how they changed from a tax base to a, to a fee based system. So 
this is something we could develop specifically for Norwalk, but this is not Norwalk. Just want to make that clear. This is another community. Right, right. No, I understood that. I, I just, I just, it, so I guess the, the question is that that's not, a, you know, generic type thing. It's not what you would see in, in, in every particular, as a rule that you would see a, a minor uh, difference in the commercial. I would think that the commercial would be tremendously higher. Well, yeah, what I do, what I generally see seriously. when we do this is, well, of course, the reduction in 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 residential lot, and I kind of okay. alluded to that in the um, yeah. in the impervious air data. But what I see a lot is you got to think about the value of the property. So, and also a lot of times commercial is, you know, if it's not a mall or something, they may build up, right? So, um, so even though they may have a lot of value to the property, um it may not have a lot of impervious area still if they're if it's five stories tall and it's on a smaller footprint and the parking garage is underneath so i don't think you can draw a direct conclusion on that um i'd say more often than not i see the what i see change a lot is the industrial because a lot of times the industrial may be in a place where the land value is not maybe as much because it's not really great land or something and and so mm -hmm. um the contribution from industrial will be larger under the fee basis than when you're actually measuring the impervious area versus the value of that property. So I, I do see that a lot um, change, so that will industrial will go up. Um, but yeah, commercial doesn't always change a lot. It's really, you see the reduction in the residential. And then a lot of times I see the increase in the industrial. And then of course, then you're adding, you know, the components of the tax exempt properties, which that just varies community by community, depending on how many, you know, nonprofits do you get in a capital city, right? You have a lot of government property where you wouldn't have in other places. So it, it mm -hmm. it's just, that's why we do it. It we, we do say it's, it is very customized to your local community. It's not a cookie cutter kind of approach. Otherwise you won't be equitable. Mm -hmm. Just one um, question that that industrial, your point about the industrial made me think of, do, have you seen, or is it an, as something that people consider um, also differentiating the rate based on the use and therefore the likelihood that the runoff is polluting as a, you know, I mean, if you think about an industrial right. runoff is probably significantly, or there's a high likelihood that it is significantly more polluting um, than, you know, your average residential runoff. So is that something that folks have ever considered or tackled you've seen in other places? Yeah, they, they, in the past, way back when we didn't have all the GIS data that we have easily at our fingertips, yes, there was a lot more of that because mm -hmm. it was just in a, you know, a base that we only knew maybe what the land use was. We didn't necessarily know the impervious area to calculate it. So a lot of them were based on kind of the type of property or the density of the property. But nowadays, the other thing you got to think about is those industrial properties very likely also have a water quality permit from the state that requires them to treat the runoff in some may way be far more aggressive way than a commercial property. So um, in a lot of cases, you know, in most cases we don't, we don't evaluate them based on their pollutant discharge because they're already regulated on that. They've already got water quality programs that are probably again, more so than any other property in your town. Mm -hmm. So you can't just make the assumption that they're a higher level of runoff pollution than someone else. So we don't see that much anymore. And if anything, they're, they're another case where we offer credits to those properties that are going over and above their permit requirements. They may have an opportunity to reduce their fee if they're, if they're doing beyond what the, the state's already requiring them to do. Yeah, well, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not you saying they do it, but I'm just, <laughs> we can offer it to them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quick question. What's been like the most common uh, structure of the authority? Has it been solely uh, run by public works or has it been like a hybrid approach between public works and I'll, finance? I'll let Dave explain um, how he has seen and then we are not there yet to think about how we're going to do it because we don't have our mind set up but Dave can go through some examples that I think he sees in other global countries. I've heard the question specifically just how to how do how do these programs normally run? Like what department runs it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. so I was asking like uh, what's been like the most common uh, structure for the authority? Has it been solely run by a, uh, public works or finance department, or has it been kind of sort of like a hybrid approach? Like what's been the most effective or common? 
Yeah, I'd say the the majority that I work on are typically in a public works department environment. I and mean, that's where a lot of the day-to-day -day operations that we talked about are happening. So, you know, typically the 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 funding side, when we talk about utility, not the not the organization side, but the funding side, it goes into an enterprise fund and those funds are distributed out to the departments that are actually implementing the service. So a lot of times when they first roll out, not much may change organizationally. It still may be public works is doing all the field work, the roadway work and the drainage work and whatever, and engineering is still doing, if it's out underneath that, it, they're still doing the plans review and the regulatory piece. Um, but but then, you know, a lot of times that over time, those consolidate maybe into one department and in, in under one umbrella. Like I've seen some merge into like, oh, you know, public works turns into like the water resource division. So where it's all the water sewer uh, waste, you know, wastewater, stormwater, whatever, all under one roof. So, um, but more often than not, when they're first implemented, I'd say the revenue is just collected into an enterprise fund. And that fund is drawn against to pay for the services in public works, the services in engineering, the services, maybe parks is doing something on greenways or whatever. And so usually there's not a lot of organizational change off the bat until the the program gets up up and running and then maybe all right well we need a stormwater manager to run this and um we need an ms4 permit coordinator to deal with the permit side so like that that's typically way i i've seen them get off the ground okay yeah so so the, the public works essentially runs the financial aspect of the two revenue, revenue collection compliance with financial regulations they, they're essentially doing everything well i answer yeah. that no it yeah. will be like very similar to how we have the wpc so the yeah. wpc yeah. is another kind of division under public works but it's a uh, enterprise fund so they are a little bit although they follow a lot of the city rules for procurement and all that um and when they bond for capital is with their money and all that but they are their funding is totally separate um, and they have a board that runs that in a way to make sure that, as Dave mentioned, to make, secure that the funds that are generated uh, by the fee is used for that purpose, for the okay, purpose that of sense. the fee. Okay, that's right. So okay. as I said, we already have two models already in place in the city. One is the WPC, that is the Wastewater Pollution Control Authority, and the other is the Parking Authority. Mm -hmm. That so, makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And so there would be no no way really that you could combine this with the WPCA. It could it work also as okay. like okay. a water Which utility or like a mm -hmm. storm yep. and wastewater utility, because then we can probably use already a lot of the infrastructure that is there and just mm -hmm. add to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what will be part of the next step. On yeah, really yeah. how to get to those details on what will be the best way to really uh, move this forward based on the structure that we already have. It has, it's it's got to be a synergistic uh, yeah. approach. Yeah. So, for example, if you've got two utilities, one's parking and one's uh, wastewater, you know, obviously parking is not the one that it's going to look like. It's going to look more like the WPCA. And if it makes sense, maybe it's just one thing. Yeah, and but, that's what the ordinance was in place because that's, that's one that's yeah. when shop machines. And staffing would be relatively similar, like that someone who has specialty in engineering with wastewater would also, yes, yeah, most likely. Yes, mm -hmm. because, because on, 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 the, on that program, depending on how it is rolled out, there will be a lot of things that will be should be in place. So, for instance, um, particularly if we start giving kind of uh, discounts uh, the, related to the impervious area. Um, I remember I was in a conference and I was watching uh, this woman that actually is a whole department for one of the big cities in California that her job was to keep track that all the benefits that they did to the properties are still being maintained. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes mm -hmm. they do put a retention base in there, but mm -hmm. guess what? Then they pay three years later, right? right? Right. So you need to go there and make sure that that is being placed and it's clean and it's right. all that. So in her case, she have thousands yeah. of them. So mm -hmm. that right. so that's why 
there will be so that's a, a paid staff position, not like the committee. People would come to the board Correct. or whatever. It, it will say, be a full impervious driveway, a gravel driveway. No, it has to be full staff. It has to be staff. under the, the enterprise. So that's why but the enterprise on I will use the WPC as an example. When the WPCA started, I doubted that they could fund all the staff that work it there. So it was a combination that the city pay for some of the operating costs and then the the authority pays for the other. Now, although we have city staff mm -hmm. working for the WPCA, their uh, salary comes straight from the WPCA and not from the city operating budget. So the same would apply. Said another way is that they have their own operating budget. Really. Yeah. So it would make sense to combine them both so that you don't have to hire separate people doing the same Correct. Job. So well, we do not know. We have to see right. that, that that's why right. I think there's yes. water engineers they're they're right. capable of doing that. You wouldn't hire a well, civil, civil engineer building parking garages to work on yeah, it's more synergistic. Water. I mean, obviously, you know, what Ralph and his team do, you may have, it might be a lot of synergy with with what he does. Well, yeah, whatever he oh, does, my. whatever he does. No, but I, I, I think it's it's a really good point because what he does is he looks at what it's going to cost, what going out ten years, how much they have to invest, and so on and so forth, and then builds his budget based on that. And so that's what we would want to do with Stormwood, whether it's whether they're the same or eventually combined or merged together. It really doesn't make that much difference. The the concept is going to be the same. Right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Any other Thanks. questions? Anybody disagree? <laughs> <laughs> no, I... Presentation. Mm -hmm. Too much orange. <laughs> That's orange. Um, yeah. uh, do you mind just uh, uh, stop sharing your screen? Sure. Thank you. I think that this has been this has been really great. I think it's mm -hmm. something that we've been, mm -hmm. and, as Lisa said, uh, you know, we've been batting around for about four or five years. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, and uh, not getting very far. And now I think we see some some positive steps forward, um, and we've got some good uh, uh, good impetus. I, I don't. I'm not gonna say momentum yet, but I think it's mm -hmm. an impetus, and we're yeah. in, in yeah. the, coming out of the starting blocks now. And so we can only get um, further, further. The only question I have is that on the on the the next steps, what, do we have a timeline yet, or um, I think that we're working on, I think that it was important to first uh, have a feeling, have this presentation mm -hmm. and try to understand how you guys feel about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We invited the whole council, they, is, I, I know a lot of couldn't make it tonight, we have extra copies if you guys want to bring it actually yeah. to them. Yeah, um, I think you guys should start having some uh, conversations internally, yeah. also of course with the administration. And then let me know, and I'm happy to start the second step as soon as you guys give me directions to. So you would put that in your budget, how you're consulting, yes, or it's yes, already there? Yes, no, I'll have to put so it on my budget. Board, board, yes, in the budget. yeah. Okay. That's why we didn't do discussion on budget today. Okay. I just need to talk about that. Well, I, I, I may have, I, we do have a line dedicated to MS4 that, in, that mm -hmm. runs under engineering actually has that that uh, that line because we do need to do a lot of compliance for that. Yeah. So we, I do not know how much I have right now, but there is already a mechanism mm -hmm. to fund. Mm -hmm. And to that point, I guess, uh, you know, thinking about how important sort of stakeholder outreach and, and yeah. public information about this is going to be. And I don't know, you know, Dave, maybe you have some thoughts, you know, how have people done this, right? I mean, it's, we struggle endlessly with getting people to turn out for meetings and hearings, and then everyone's furious nine months later when you're like, yeah. So how, you know, what have, what have people done successfully to kind of spread the word on this? Have you seen good examples we should consider, you know, thinking about starting? Yeah. I mean, what I, the most, especially in, in states where there's like, where I live, there's these, you're all over the place. 
there's not much discussion. They get implemented. But in places like when I said, I've been working on these for 20 years. When we were when you're first starting in a place where they're not as familiar with it, it does require uh, what we see the most successful is some kind of stakeholder involvement. So you're going to get a committee of people together, however they get appointed. Maybe it's your council members or what have you. But it's some property owners, um, commercial interest, nonprofit interest. In your case, the hospital, like the people that are going to be impacted, right, by the fee. Oh, you, 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 you home, I, well, you'd be surprised. They pay these fees all over the country. You'll never hear from Home Depot, but yeah, it's the, so it's right, the, you right. know, it's the, all the other folks that aren't used to seeing it, don't know what it is. If it popped up on their bill tomorrow, they'd be like, "What are you charging me for?" So. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's bringing a group of those people together, maybe it's 10, 12 people, and it's walking through a lot of what we talked about today, but more in a systematic way. What is stormwater? What are these problems? Why is it an issue? What are we doing about it? And then get into the, here's the different ways to pay for it. But it's, so maybe it's like five or six meetings where you take them through that process to let them understand what the problem is, what the services are, what services are required to do that? What are those costs? And then have them provide input on the level of service that, that we talked about um, that Vanessa mentioned is because ultimately you got to select how, what is this program really going to look like? Are we going to clean our streets once a week or once a month? Are we going to clean the drains once a year, once every five years? And all those have cost implications. So it's kind of getting to that balance of what is the service level that needs to be provided and what is the fee associated with that and, and get some public input so that when you go back to the council later, there's some buy-in from the public. Like no one's going to love the idea, right? But it's like, all right, we see this is why the city's doing this. And so if you just have like a one-off public meeting, you're right. No one shows up. The only people are going to show up are the ones that hate it. <laughs> um, so you really need to get people that that are, you know, involved in the community are, are, are representing these various interests and educate them so that they can go back to their constituents and say, yeah, this is what the city's thinking about. You know, no one wants new fees, new taxes, right? No one ever is going to say, that's what I want. But, but educating them on why the need is and why it's maybe a better approach than other things. And that's where I've seen it be the most successful in getting it off the ground in a place where it's not common, where people don't can't go next door and say, oh, I, yeah, my friend pays that fee. They know what that is. And they, you know, they, that's yeah. a, you know, so it does take some time in a newer state where they're not as common to kind of get through that education process. But that's typically the the most common way people do that. I had, um, I had one quick question on that. Um, have you seen where, where people understand the it's not a, a new tax that it's it's I'm breaking some of the tax that you're getting charged now into a, a separate fee that you can understand what it is. Yeah, but that's part of that education process is explain. I think most people don't probably think about how stormwater is paid for, and so showing them that, you know, that your tax, your revenue, your, your taxes that you pay on your property, and that's one of the things that goes to fund, and um, and explain to that those pros and cons of like, look, everybody, you know, only portion portion of their community pays this, right? Mm -hmm. are, but everyone else is contributing as well. So there needs to be some equity in that. So really the equity discussion is probably the, the biggest key um, to get across to folks of why there's a different way. And that it's no different than the water bill you pay, the sewer bill you pay, the electric bill mm -hmm. you pay. Those are all based on some kind of consumption or service. And stormwater hasn't always been funded that way, but it's an infrastructure system like everything else you see. And it should be run like a utility that like every other utility you you currently you know, pay I think for. I remember in, when we were in New London, one of the things that they said is they brought together a committee of all these types of stakeholders that you were mentioning. And you might remember this too, Barbara, that they said that when they had that committee, one of the people who was most opposed to it changed his mind when he found out that people, other people weren't paying for the things that we were having to pay for as residents. Mm -hmm. But another yeah. thing I was talking about in Norwalk is, you know, we have all these neighborhood associations. Yeah. That's a great way oh, to yeah, plug in. Yeah. Certainly in my district, yeah. I don't know about other yes. centrics, yeah. but we have three or four where we could go and bring this presentation. And I think people would be oh, yeah. pretty impressed by it. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing that I think is a real yeah. plus from my perspective yeah. is that where I live, we have probably the most amount of trees anywhere. 
and the drains are always clogged with leaves at this point. So all of my neighbors are constantly cleaning the drains, and I know that DPW comes through and cleans a lot of them too. But it would be really nice to have a you know committee that you could go to and say, hey, this this drain needs cleaning, or that doesn't too. So in a in a really it gives them more accountability and, and a way to really feel like they're being heard, which I think will be positive for some, a lot of people. So. Yeah, and kind of related to that, a lot of times that stakeholder committee that you use to educate on why there's a need, some form of that may, you know, there's an option to continue that going forward. Maybe it's a smaller group of a, you know, of a stormwater advisory committee that like as, the, you know, kind of like this is the committee that's gonna that was involved in the setup is gonna make sure that it gets implemented in the way that everyone decided it was the best approach. So that's we see that mm -hmm. a lot as well. That continuing, um, so again, a smaller group. It's not a dozen people, but maybe it's five or six that are you know help every year in the budgeting process. They kind of have some insight into why the fees are or what they are, and so it, it's just another way to sort of have that public transparency of like, yeah, it's a new program, but we're gonna make sure that it's run properly and efficiently. But you're right, it, it is, you can convert stakeholders that way. One one of the ones that I did, the the head, the guy that was on the committee for, for to represent the churches, he actually made the presentation to the board to recommend it. Like he, he was like, hey, I know I've, I know we don't pay now, but I really see the need and of course, he had a drainage issue out front of his church, um, but uh, but you know that's what we like to have too. That they have that committee help make that presentation. So it's not a consultant coming in saying you need to do this. It's not a staff member saying we need more money. It's no, there's a public the public acknowledgement that it's a better way to go, and so it can help with that. You know, getting over the hurdle of the public to that acceptance. Point, you know, we we have a, a situation in Ola, which. Uh, uh, showed itself last year where we saw a change in in the burden of taxes go from a residential over to commercial. Yeah. And this would be another opportunity to switch those back again yeah. and make it a little bit more equitable. Uh -huh. So that's something that, that hopefully that's going to change in, in the years to come. But um, it's a great selling point today. Mm -hmm. It's good with shifting that back to commercial as opposed to yeah. uh, bur uh, carrying the burden in the residential. Mm -hmm. so. And I know listening to the most recent of the, the zoning meeting this week, last week yeah, um, they were talking a lot about having, you know, pervious versus impervious surfaces with new development and, and renovation of development. But there's one across the street that we're talking about yeah. actually pulling up a lot of it, you know, having getting rid of a lot of the asphalt, which is good. Right. So I think right. it would really help. Well, because Encourage again, them. just to add to that is that through engineering, actually, uh, they have to, well, we already have mm -hmm. a drainage plan that everyone has to obey. So we are trying to minimize the runoff into the property when you're doing any upgrades. Okay. Any other questions? I have one thing. I just would like to take a moment to give kudos to Vanessa yeah. for taking this on and your yeah. openness to tackle everything we bring you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just I think on behalf of all of us I want to thank you for thank you thank you yes no thank you but again I, I I didn't do anything by myself you know uh, the staff is great that they are here although it's seven fifteen <laughs> and tomorrow we have to leave at six a.m. because we have to be in this conference like that is an hour and a half right here uh, but of course CGM Smith they did a fantastic job yeah. where yeah, yeah, great, very great presentation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the way as I said they have been working with us for over a year now and mm -hmm. so thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so we're joining okay. at the uh, seven fifteen. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.